Well, before we um, before I read the scriptures, um, Paul, we'd like to welcome you. May a blessing be upon you and your household since you decided to be part of this flock, just like all the other preachers that were here before. Thank you for accepting um, to be our preacher, Paul. Amen. In, the, in the same way, count yourself dead to sin, but alive to God and Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as, as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. May God add a blessing to all who hear his word. Amen. I loved, uh, I think it was intentional, uh, Doug chose uh, the one song this morning, uh, said, um, God has made his saints victorious, sin and death shall not prevail. Did I say Doug? Yeah. David. You're David. Yeah, one of those pagan coughs. Um, so uh, Doug is a pagan cough, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. I know the ones I haven't met. Um, it's the ones I've met I have trouble with. Um, no, it's so, it's, it's so good that, that sit, de or, uh, God has made his saints victorious. Sin and death shall not prevail. And it, when we sing that song, it's, it's supposed to kind of resonate, you know, that, that particular part of the song, the way it's written. Um, and yet, it seems like, uh, you know, we don't always walk around as if God has made his saints victorious, right? We do have a problem with that. And last week, we were visiting in Richmond, uh, Virginia, a church, uh, Three Chopped, Church of Christ, weird name, but the road that it's on is called is Three Chopped Road. So we were at the Church of Christ on Three Chopped Road in Richmond, Virginia, and uh, Brother Billy McGuigan uh, was was giving the message, and it was better than mine will be today because he had an Irish accent, and um, my kids were mesmerized by it. They were like, "Oh, I really wish that we had someone with an Irish accent." You know, I thought about trying it to this morning, but I I was no good. Um, and so I'm not going to even attempt it. Uh, but it was, it was good to hear him speak about Sunday living versus Saturday living. It was Easter, and we focused on the resurrection. And one of the, the traditions that there is in a lot of churches that, well, I didn't grow up with this tradition, partially because we didn't really mention Easter as being anything any different than any other Sunday. We note that we, we celebrate the same thing every Sunday. So when Easter comes, it's a little less of a grand event or grand affair in a lot of churches of Christ. Um, because of communion even being every Sunday, it kind of helps us to focus on that. But he spoke about Saturday living, you know, and, and how most of the world is in Saturday living. We're living in the time after Christ is dead, but he's not risen. There's no hope. Sin and death are prevailing, and life seems meaningless. It's just an ongoing, losing battle to find satisfaction, and nothing satisfies. And it's, it, it's this kind of living that today's message is meant to be an antidote for. 
because what he spoke so passionately about was Sunday living, you know, living after the resurrection. How, how did things change for these disciples who would go on, many of them, to become martyrs, and they never looked back? You know, Peter, who was terrified of what the consequences would be for acknowledging his friendship and his faith in Christ, then goes on to be so incredibly bold as you read his words in Acts. He is not afraid of anyone. How does the resurrection change the way that we live each and every day? Sin and death shall not prevail, right? Sin and death shall not prevail. And as we come to the message this morning and we get into Romans chapter 6, a little bit in Colossians chapter 3, I know that in this congregation, some of you have a prevailing sin, right? My guess is that all of us have a sin that is kind of we feel is uniquely our sin. It probably isn't, right? There's probably someone else in the room that is struggling with the same sin. But we all come with what we would consider, I think, a prevailing sin. And if we're living in that Saturday frame of mind, you've pretty much just given up any hope of that changing. As I was praying about what message was needed here, I'm going to tell you what came to mind because it came to mind multiple times. I couldn't get it out of my head. And, and I may just really offend you and you may revoke your offer, right? <laughs> it's a dangerous thing. Um, but this is what I got. I got there's a sin problem. There's a sin problem in this congregation. Now you could say, well, that's not unique. You're right. It's, it's probably not. But it was a word that I received multiple times while praying for this congregation and thinking about what I might speak on. So I do know that in this room, there is a sin problem, right? And some of you are living in a sin that you are just ready to get out of, but it is scary. It is hard to acknowledge it. It's hard to, to come clean. It's hard. There is a bondage that we're in when we don't confess our sin. Sin shall not be your master, though, for you are not under the law. You are under grace. And so when we are under grace, we are free to say, I've got this sin. And there is unconfessed sin in the congregation. That's a pretty safe bet whether I get a word or not. I'm, I'm hesitating to say right, because my family counted my rights the last time I was here. And it was a lot of rights. Correct? Um, is it not so? Um, Get what I'm saying? Right now. So uh, we're going to talk about setting our minds on things above. Uh, Since then you have been raised doesn't appear in the primary text for today. It appears in Colossians chapter 3 in the first four verses. And you're going to memorize that this week. You didn't know that, but you're going to do it. Um, that in Galatians 2.20. But it's that Sunday morning perspective after the resurrection. Not just the resurrection of Christ, but the resurrection of our very selves. And so, and everything in our lives that's dead apart from Christ, and that's hopeless. It's living in the recognition of the redemption of every part of our life that is lying dormant or in death. This is what we live in. This is our paradigm for viewing life. And so since then we have been raised is the focus. And we'll close on that passage. Um, I need to get that remote. Is it up here? Okay. We'll see if I can remember how to operate it. There we go. So we're in Romans chapter 6. If you want to follow along in the text, because I'll be moving around within chapter 6, uh, I would get that out and turn to it. But the first four verses, uh, unfortunately, so often these are used in churches that practice baptism as we do. They're, they're used as a proof text for how we do baptism and what it, what it signifies and whether it's effectual or not for anything. And so that's, that's where we get hung up so much of the time. The Apostle Paul, of course, wasn't actually writing an argument for practicing baptism the way we practice baptism. That wasn't the point of the message in this part of Romans. So we're not going to focus on that either, okay? He just assumes in these first four verses, uh, by the way, if you're in the church, you all, you've been baptized, right? And then he moves on to the point about what that signifies. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? 
We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. This is a really powerful passage, partially because of where it's located in Romans. Up to this point, we have this teaching that everybody's guilty of sin, right? Remember in chapter 3, he says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then he talks about how we're justified. We're justified freely by grace through the work of Christ. And through that one man, we're justified not of works, but by faith. And so Paul doesn't say, you must not go on sinning so that you can be righteous. Right? When he says, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase, his response is not this. He doesn't say no, because if you sin, you will lose your salvation. You won't be saved. That's not actually what he's getting at, right? So what he's getting at is something else. He asks the rhetorical question. He says, we died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Josh, I think you were talking about a rhetorical question a couple of weeks ago, right? Up at communion, I believe. And so here's a rhetorical question for the kids. Kids, if you've already fallen asleep because I'm boring you, or you're doing something on a gadget, or drawing, or doodling, Arden, you can listen to this part. So um, let's, say, let, let's say that your mother says to you, how are you ever going to have a clean room if you don't start putting your clothes away? It's not a question that you answer. You don't describe how you're going to have a clean room without putting your clothes away. Right? She's making a statement. You're not going to have a clean room if you don't put your clothes away. Right? It's not a question. It's actually a statement. She's asserting something. If your father says to you, how do you expect to have friends or how are you going to make friends if you don't start treating people with more kindness? That's not really a question. That's a statement. You're not going to have friends or keep them if you don't treat them with kindness. Right? How are you going to go on sinning if you're dead to sin? Uh, let's make that a statement. You're not going to go on sinning if you're dead to sin, right? So he asked this question. He says, we died to sin. Here's a statement. How can we live in it any longer? We can't, right? What's our motivation for not going on sinning? <laughs> We can't choose sin. That's not an option. It's, it's not an option. I, I'm, I died to sin. I, what, there's no struggle here. But, but there is a struggle here. Romans has a, a section on that struggle. It's coming up. We're not getting to it today. Let's talk about that. Romans chapter 6, verses 5 through 11. If we've been united with him like this in his death we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe we also will live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. When I was in college, I went through a period of time where I was digging into the word and in love with God and singing out in chapel and you know, having late night spiritual conversations and hanging calendars of half-naked girls up in my room. What? Like, both were happening. It was all over the Christian campus dorm. <laughs> Something was out of whack. At one point, uh, somebody, a prophetic friend, woke me up to the inconsistency, and, uh, and that came down, and instead, we put up a sign that said, I am a slave to righteousness. Right? I am dead to sin. We had all of these things around the room. Um, they worked. It was really helpful. We needed a new paradigm. Since we'd been raised, we needed a new paradigm. Um, and so we posted it. You see, here's, here's basically what we just, what we read. The objection is this. 
and we've all had this objection. In fact, it's been very popular in, in our churches, in our fellowship, to talk about the danger of saying that you're saved by grace. Now, that's interesting because it shouldn't be a dangerous statement, seeing as it's the statement that Scripture makes really clear, clearly. I mean, if it's dangerous, it's dangerous like to Satan, you know? It's dangerous to his minions. Um, the, the message is that we're saved by grace, but the, the response to that is, wait, wait, wait. If we're saved by grace, then we can live however we want. And you can't go around telling people they can live however they want, right? You've got to hold something over their head, like we do in our legal system. Do we not have punishments that we hope will be a deterrent? Yes. Yes. We hope that if we put this consequence out there, then it'll deter people from sinning or breaking the law, right? Well, people who, who are foolish and passionately angry or bitter or greedy, they don't think about consequences, right? They just act out of their passion. Scripture teaches us that. We act out of our desires. If we just did what we knew, we would never break a law because we wouldn't want the consequence. Nobody wants the consequence, but it doesn't change our behavior. But we're still afraid of accepting this message of grace because, well, it's kind of dangerous. I mean, at some point, grace runs out, Fisher. Right? And can I talk about being saved by grace without throwing a disclaimer out there? You're saved by grace, but, but, grace isn't cheap. Well, we know that. We, we've seen the cross. Grace isn't cheap. Right? Well, but if you sin, it's like you're rejecting grace, and then eventually there's no more grace. I don't know. I'm not going to give you a disclaimer. Paul clearly saw this problem, right? That's why he said, either people were suggesting this, or people were just struggling in sin. And so he had to ask the question, rhetorically, to get at this problem. He says, no. No, of course we don't do that, right? And we all know that. Dead people don't sin. It's, it's like he says to us, you know, you can't live in sin because that's not who you are. You're not even that kind of creature anymore. You're, you're a new creation. You, you walk in newness of life, some translations say here. And yet you could look back over your, the last three hours and say, yeah, but in the last three hours, I, I acted as though I had that nature. <laughs> you know, I, I sinned in the last three hours. And he says to you, yeah, that's not who you are. That is not who you are. You are this, so now become what you are, is, is kind of the message. He says, in what we just read through verse 11, you know, when Christ died, believers in some crucial way, we died with him and in him and were united with him in his death. And when he was raised, in some really important way, we were raised with him and made alive in him. And what was true for him is true for us. So we're commanded to become in practice what we actually are in Christ, dead to sin and alive to God. The reason that you can be confident that today, if your life is taken from you, you will go to be with Christ if you are in him, the reason you can be confident of that is because of the reality that you sit in right now in that pew. You are righteous. You are holy because he has made you holy. You are dead to sin. Sin is dead to you. It has no power in your life. If you have sinned, well, you've sinned. <laughs> Go get some grace for that. But you are not lost in Christ because you have made a sinful decision. He says you are dead to sin. It is no longer your master. Why would you live as though it is? Why would you live as though it's a choice? It is not. You are dead to sin, but alive to God. Sin shall not be your master. You know, the law doesn't empower us, but grace does. And Paul talks about this in Titus. He says, it, and if you turn there, you'll find that I'm telling you the truth. In verse 11, make some water. Verse 11, he identifies that it's grace 
that we're talking about. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Eager to do what is good. This is different than being eager to avoid evil. Now, avoiding evil is good, right? So in a way, that's desiring to do good. The law causes us to eagerly desire to avoid wrong. It does, because the law speaks judgment, right? The law speaks our guilt, points it out, right? It makes us aware of how woefully short we fall, and we tend to want to make up for it, you know, but then we always fall short. You get deflated pretty quickly, right? When you try to be righteous by your works, because you never make it, right? It's not very empowering. You just see yourself as more and more guilty. Grace does a different thing, though. It makes us eager to do good. Here's why. Sin shall not be your master. When Christ came to the woman who was caught in adultery, he showed her grace, did he not? Yes. Tremendous grace. The shame and disgrace that this woman lived with defined her life. And in that moment, it was searing pain. And Jesus, in essence, looked at her and said, Sin shall not be your master. There is a much kinder master than sin. We will all be enslaved by something. We are not as strong as we think we are. You will be enslaved to something or someone. And Romans 6 says, in the following verses through verse 23, you will either be a slave to sin or you will be a slave to righteousness. Which one do you want to be your master? Well, if you are in Christ, it's a done deal. Your master is God. You are a slave to righteousness. You don't have to be under the cruel whip of sin anymore. Not the shame associated with it, not the lies about your standing with God. You are free to rejoice in your kind and gracious master and to walk away from that sin without looking back. Paul said in Philippians, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Grace is a master that allows us to do that, to forget what is behind. It's already dealt with. It is dead to you. And move forward move forward. This is the message. We've been freed from that tyrannical master. In, in the next part of uh, Romans, we get this description. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. Woohoo! Free from the control of righteousness. Yes, I can do whatever I want. Oh, this is a part of our church culture because when we talk about youth group activities, we say, well, there's a lot of fun activities on the, on the schedule. When are we going to do something spiritual? And if you're the youth, you go, okay, so, like, spiritual things are boring or hard work and, you know, unspiritual or neutral. There's no such thing. Neutral things over here are, are, are kind of fun. So let's get out of church and go do the fun stuff, right? Now, don't get me wrong. I can't tell them this is fun if it's not. <laughs> you know, like, let's be really honest. It's, eh, it's not always fun, right? Now, we know as we get older, my kids know that I like uh, this thing called delayed gratification. They, they were making fun of it, bringing it up the other day. Apparently, when, when they're older, they'll say, my dad used to always say, you know, good things come to those who wait and so forth. There is a glorious fun in delayed gratification. It is wonderful to put off receiving something pleasurable for later. It's a wonderful thing. Partially because you know it won't be as good as you think it will be, so just save your disappointment for later. <laughs> nothing, nothing that we actually think is going to be so awesome really is, other than being with our Lord, right? And so... Um, 
I'm really getting on a tangent, but the point is we celebrate being out from under the control of righteousness when we're, when we're young. I hope we don't do that as we get older because what we find after we get out from under that awful, wicked master righteousness is that we're in worse shape than we were. We want to go back to that master and say, Mom, Dad, I didn't know what I was doing. I wish I'd listened to you. Father, I wish I'd listened to you. You are a much better master. I should never have run away, right? Um, so he says, how's that working for you? What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you're now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness. And the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's two verses I want you to memorize this week. They're not difficult. It's more than two verses. It's, it's two passages. But uh, you already know the first one. I guarantee it. Can somebody quote Galatians 2.20? You might not know it's Galatians 2.20. You're singing it. Yeah, that's why we know it. There's this, there's this song we sing, I've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. You know that one? Um, that's how I know it. And then I discovered it was Galatians 2.20, and I was like, got that one. I already know Galatians 2.20. Um, it, it summarizes the, what Paul's pointing out in Romans 6, right? I've been crucified. This is Romans 6, 1 through 6 or so. Uh, I've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. I mean, yet not I, it's Christ living in me. And the life that I live in this flesh, I live to God, just as it said about Jesus in Romans 6, right? So you can take all of those verses and get it boiled down to this one. If you know this one, this is your paradigm. This is, this is your worldview. This is how you look at your life. I've been crucified with Christ. Next time you're tempted to sin, you say, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. You are dead to me, sin. You are not a choice. You are not a choice. And just because I did this yesterday, or I did it the day before, I did it last week, and I continue to let God down, or I continue to let people down, doesn't mean anything, because you are dead and forgotten. Right this moment, I am free from you. That is the reality. We just have to live in that reality, or we give that whip right back to sin. And we say, all right, fine, beat me up a little bit more. That is not who we are. Colossians 3, 1 through 4. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your minds on things above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. You died. And your life is now hidden in Christ. Does that sound like Galatians 2.20? Your life is now hidden in Christ. And when Christ, who is your life, appears then you also will appear with him in glory, right? Set your mind on things above. And then your other assignment, if you choose to accept it, is to look at the rest of Colossians 3. Because if I were speaking to you next week, I would be saying, what, is this, what does this look like? You know, give me a flavor of it. And Colossians 3 gives you that flavor. It says, since these things are dead to you, Get rid of them, and it, and it gives you the list. And the list is like a brainstorm session for you. Because sometimes we're not listening to the Holy Spirit at all. We're letting everything else drown him out. And what that list does of the things we're to put off is it starts to kind of prime the pump a little bit in our minds so that we can see more discerningly what's going on with us. You read through it and you say, yeah, okay, bitterness, rage, malice, and you start asking yourself, okay, what, what part of that do I have in me? How am I letting that control me? Um, there's unforgiveness in the room. That's, that's a master that will destroy you. It's so bad that Jesus says if you can't forgive, you're not going to be forgiven. So there's, go through that list and then get to the end of it and notice the bookend at the end of that chapter says, so whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, count yourselves dead to sin but alive to God. The life I live in the flesh, I live by faith. Right? All of these things. See how they all connect? 
It's a beautiful tapestry. It's all the same truth, right? These two right here, if you will memorize these, they will become wonderful counselors to you because Satan will twist and will feed you lies about who you are and you, he will take the whip back. Let grace snatch that whip from sin. It shall no longer be your master. So here's the conclusion. Let's remind you of these two things and we'll wrap up. Dead people don't sin. Okay? I know you're alive in Christ. But in that passage, you're dead to sin. The old man is dead. And it's not mechanical, right? It's not like, okay, I, I surrendered my life to Christ. I was baptized. And then it's like he's still there, the old man, right? It's not mechanical. It's a daily choosing to live in the reality that God has placed you in in his son. And it's true every moment, whether you've lived it or not. It's true. You don't clean it all up to make it true again. Right? It's true. I am dead to sin and alive to God from the moment I have a contrite heart. Remember that. Become what you already are. Allow God to minister that grace to you this morning. And then, how would believing this change the way you're living? That's the assignment. Look at those two verses. Try to commit those to memory. At least get really familiar with the idea. And read through Colossians 3. Ask yourself, which of these things are a part of my life? How would that change if I really was convicted about who I am in Christ? If this morning you have a sin that this morning when I was speaking, you're like, yep, I have that sin. It's unconfessed. And I'm letting the sin rule me by keeping quiet. Right? That's what happens. Then I'm begging you now, and the Spirit is calling you, to go ahead and share that with a brother or sister. You don't have to come forward with it, but it'd be great if you did. You'll find exponential freedom in sharing with the whole family. But if you can share with just one member of this family, if you can voice your sin to God this morning out loud and say, God, here is what I'm guilty of, I know you walk around thinking, he already knows. He already knows, Paul. I don't have to tell him. You have to tell him. That's how it works. You have to say the words to your father. You have to say them to a brother or sister. This is an invitation to do that. And all that does is it just snatches that whip from sin, which shall not be your master, for you are not under the law, you are under grace. And that's the invitation this morning. Always stand and sing.